If you're worshiping with us online, we also welcome you. This is the day the Lord's made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. So would you take 37 seconds and say to hi to somebody around you? Trying to fill the 
same old holes inside There's a better life There's a better life If you've got pain He's a pain taker If you feel lost He's a way maker If you need freedom or safety be seated. Join me as we pray together. Father, we do know you are the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through you. So, Father, we embrace our faith and our relationship with you because of your blood shed for us. I thank you for every person in this room, every person worshiping with us online. Father, that you would draw us all closer to you, all closer to one another. Lord, help us to be a source of encouragement and love to one another as we experience the peace that only comes from knowing you through the leadership and guidance of your Holy Spirit. Father, speak to us as your word is spoken in this room and in rooms through the Life Group Hour. I thank you for every person. I pray that you would be honored by everything we think, do, and say. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. i 
seated. Good morning, and thank you for joining us for worship at Hillcrest. Listen now for information on key upcoming events. Remember, you can always find more details for these and other Hillcrest happenings online at hillcrest.church slash events. Calling all men to come join us at Mana beginning Thursday, September 4th at 6.30 a.m. in the Fellowship Center, room A-167. We will enjoy breakfast, a Bible study, discussion, and prayer as we connect with God and other men. There is no charge for participation. Agape Pregnancy Resource Center provides ethical and confidential services in a caring environment to care for women and families who are facing an unexpected pregnancy. Agape's 21st Annual Partners for Life will be held on Monday, September 16th at 6.30 p.m. at Kalahar Resorts in Round Rock, featuring guest speaker Kirk Karen. This is Agape's most important fundraiser of the year. As they celebrate life and this major milestone, a high demand for tables and a record number of attendees is anticipated. Please join us for this special event and consider sponsoring a table. The Heart and Soul Life Group is a place to go deeper into prayer and life together. This is a space for men and women to share how God is working in their lives at the heart level and encourage one another through concentrated prayer for each other and God's purposes at Hillcrest. The group will often be divided into two groups, heart for the women and soul for the men, but will sometimes meet and pray together as well. The group will meet in the sanctuary immediately following Coffee Fellowship. To keep up with all that Hillcrest Church has to offer, please fill out a connection card. You can find a physical copy in the worship bulletin on Sunday or complete the online connection card at this link anytime. As our thanks for doing this, please pick up a copy of our pastor's book, The Pursuit of Happiness. You'll find it on display at the exit doors. And if you want to know more about placing your faith in Jesus or joining our church, there's a spot on the card to ask for that information too. Hillcrest wants to be a place where people in the greater Austin area can find and follow Jesus together. Won't you join us? Well, today we end our nine-week study through the characteristics that the Apostle Paul listed off as the fruit of the Spirit. So one more time, would you read with me Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When you let the Spirit of Jesus guide you and empower you, these characteristics will show up in your life like fruit, like the outcome of a process. And so we've looked at the first eight of these nine characteristics across the last couple of months. And if you want to review those sermons or watch them for the first time, you can watch them on our website, hillcrest.church, or our YouTube channel, hillcrest to go We end today with the last characteristic, and for a lot of us, we would admit the last characteristic we'll ever be successful at developing, self-control. Now, most weeks of our study, we looked at people who demonstrated the word of the day. And so we looked at Isaac to see what forbearance looks like, and Dorcas or Tabitha to see what kindness looks like, Ruth and Boaz to see what goodness looked like, Daniel to see what faithfulness looks like, Moses as an example of gentleness. But today, when we come to this study of self-control, we're going to look at somebody who was the exact opposite of somebody who had good self-control. We're going to look at the world's weakest strongman. His name was Samson. Samson was a living example of the warning given to us in Proverbs chapter 28, or Proverbs chapter 25, verse 28. Proverbs 25, 28 says, a person without self-control is like a city with broken down walls. So the Bible compares you to a city, but if you lack self-control, 
you are a city with broken down walls. So let's ask how and where and what. How are you meant to be like a city? Where do you have broken down walls? And if you don't do anything about it, what will result? So first of all, and you can look at your sermon notes, how are you meant to be like a city? The wise man in Proverbs 25, 28 said, you are like a city. Jesus said the same thing. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, Jesus said his followers were a city set on a hill which cannot be hidden. Now, I've seen your Facebook posts when you've gone off to beautiful cities here in the United States or around the world. What impresses you about an impressive city? its size or its energy or its creativity. A city is a place of creativity and energy. A, a, a city is a place where resources are concentrated together so that something profitable might result that benefits the individual or benefits the, the betterment of society. You are meant to be like that. You are meant to be a person of energy, of resourcefulness. You're to identify the resources that God has given you and use them in, the, in ways that are profitable for yourself or for the betterment of other people. You are like a city. Now, if people are cities, Samson was New York. He was a big, big city. His story starts out so promising. I mean, his entire biography is only four chapters long. Did you know that? Judges chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16, just four chapters. And 25% of that, the entirety of Judges chapter 13, is all about his conception and his birth. Uh, Judges chapter 13 tells us that the angel of the Lord came to a couple who were having difficulty conceiving and, they pro and the angel promised them that they would conceive and have a son who would save his people. Now that's the entire 25, the first 25% of Samson's story. With something like that, you would assume that something remarkable was going to come of a life like that. And at first it seems like indeed it did. This was a time when uh, God's people were often threatened by enemies, physically threatened, threatened with death, threatened with invasion. And God would raise up these judges, not men and women in black robes with gavels, but, but heroes, military heroes who would protect the people. And Samson certainly was able to do that. In fact, he was able to do it single-handedly. He had this long, uncut hair. I mean, he could have come straight out of a Marvel movie. He had this massive body. All by himself, he killed dozens in one fight scene. In another fight scene with the jawbone of a donkey, he, he killed 1,000 all by himself. In another scene, uh, his enemies surrounded the town where he was in the middle of the night, and they wanted to waylay him first thing in the morning. And so in the middle of the night, he got up, and on his shoulders, he lifted up those gates and the posts that the, that the gates were hanging on and carried them out of the town. This was a one-man army, literally. But this man who was so physically strong was morally weak until his last repentant prayer his entire life was spoiled and impulsive and demanding and arrogant and lacking in judgment. He had no self-control. And that leads me to the second question I want to ask today, and that is, where do you have broken down walls? The first question was, how is your life like a city? The Bible compares your life to a city. How is your life like a city? But then the second question we should ask from this text is, where do you have broken down walls? Proverbs 25, again, uh, verse 28 again says, a person without self-control is like a city with broken down walls. Now the image here is someone with energy and productivity and creativity, just like is concentrated inside a city, but it is an unprotected city, and they don't realize how vulnerable they really are. If Samson was an example of a massive city, he was also an example of someone who had massive gaps in the wall around his city, somebody who neglected the wall around his city. Now where were his walls broken down? If you're familiar with this story, I don't know if you've ever noticed that there, were, there are two recurring images that show up over and over again in Samson's story. The first image or metaphor is eyes, and the second is heart, eyes and heart. So Samson was physically strong, but he had weak eyes and a weak heart. I don't mean the physical organs of the eyes and the heart. The biblical writer of Judges is using these two things as symbols, as images, as metaphors to help us understand how frail 
Samson really was. So first of all, the eyes. Now, it's interesting, twice the writer of Judges said everyone did whatever is right in their own eyes. But as it turns out, the leader of the people, Samson himself, did whatever was right in his own eyes as well. It shows up twice in Judges chapter 14. So uh, uh, first of all, we find in Judges chapter 14, verse 3, Samson chose his wife, his first wife, as a young man because she is right in my eyes, that says in Judges chapter 14, verse 3. And then to drive home the point, the metaphor reappears in verse 7. She was right in Samson's eyes. So at this time in uh, the history of God's people, the entire people did whatever was right in their own eyes. That phrase shows up twice in Judges. When a people who do whatever is right in their own eyes are led by leaders who do whatever is right in their own eyes, this story is not going to end and they all lived happily ever after. God had forbidden his people to marry outside the faith. And this woman was among the pagan enemies of Israel, but Samson didn't care. He didn't make decisions based on God's word. He did what seemed right to him. Now, like I said, this idea of the eyes was a symbol or a metaphor of Samson's poor judgment. Whatever he saw with his eyes went straight to his brain without ever assessing or determining whether that was a good thing to let into his brain. You know, the great reformer Martin Luther said, I can't keep the birds from flying over my head, but I can keep them from making a nest in my hair. Now, what he meant by that was that we have all these images, we have all these impressions, we have all these thoughts that flit constantly around us. We can't control that, but we can control them taking up residence within us. We can control those things making a home within us. Samson had no discernment like that. You know, the Apostle John in the New Testament warned about what he called the lust of the eyes. 1 John Chapter 2, verse 16. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. Now we see that word lust, and we immediately assume that what John is talking about here is sexual sin, sexual images, sexual desire. And it certainly includes that, but it includes any sort of craving that is out of order, that is not within the plan of the Word of God. So, items we don't really need to buy, the lust of the eyes. Food we don't really need to eat, the lust of the eyes. That one drink too many that we don't really need to order, the lust of the eyes. So the eyes serve as a metaphor in Samson's story for somebody who had disordered judgment. He wasn't letting his assessment, his discernment, his decisions be made under the guidance of the Word of God, and so therefore he lacked self-control. The other metaphor in Samson's life is even more serious, the heart. I said that he was a strong man, but he, he, had, a, he had weak eyes and a weak heart. That isn't a reference to the physical organs of the eyes and the heart. It's a, again, it's a metaphor, it's a symbol. If the eyes were a symbol of his poor judgment, the heart was a symbol of his poor affections, his poor longings. Now, what is the heart in the Bible? I mean, the, uh, during the Romantic era in English literature and, and American literature, ever since then, we've assumed that the heart has to do with feelings. Trust your feelings, Luke. Isn't that what we're told in one of our favorite movies? It's all about the feelings. But in the Bible, what does the Bible mean when it speaks about the heart? For example, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. So what is the wise man referring to when he says guard your heart? What does that mean, heart? In the Bible, the heart isn't just about our feelings, but about our longings, our affections, your, your idea of happiness, uh, your idea of fulfillment, your idea of what will make you feel secure and significant and worthwhile. Whatever that is guides everything about you. It guides your decisions. It determines your choices. It, 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 it drives every high joy and low depression that you go through. 
Tim Keller said this, what the heart most wants, the mind finds reasonable, the emotions find valuable, the will finds doable. That is so profound. It is, of course, the mind and the emotions and the will that are sort of front of stage, but all of these things are in service to the heart. Whatever the heart wants, the mind goes, that's reasonable to me. The emotions go, I find that valuable. The will goes, we can make that work. But it's all driven by the heart. That's why I find that phrase from him so profound. What the heart most wants, the mind finds reasonable, the emotions find valuable, the will finds doable. And so the wise man said in Proverbs, guard your heart because everything you do flows from it. Now did Samson guard his heart? No. After his disastrous early marriage ended uh, in uh, Judges chapter 14, we have this 20-year gap in his life. Again, there are only four chapters that make up his biography, Judges 13, 14, 15, and 16. And after his disastrous early marriage, there's this 20-year gap. Uh, we know that he is a judge or a military leader of, of, uh, of, of Israel, but we don't know anything else about him. And then suddenly you turn to chapter 16, and right at the start of chapter 16, we have this story of him seeing this prostitute and going to spend the night with her. Now, it's interesting that there's that word about the eyes again. He sees what he wants, and he goes and spends the night with his prostitute. We see this at the start of Judges chapter 16. But the way it's laid out, it seems like the Bible writer is letting us know this is just the way he spent his years those, in that 20-year gap between his disastrous first marriage and this next story that we're going to look at. 20 years of just living this dissolute life, sleeping with whomever he wanted to, whoever he laid his eyes on. This is the way he sort of wasted his years from his 20s to his early 40s. But then we get to the first woman in the story with a name. Have you ever noticed that when you've read through Samson's story? All these other women that are in his life, even his first marriage, there's no name. It's almost as if their lives were so insignificant to Samson they're not even worthy of having a name in the story, but we certainly get the name of this woman in the story. Her name was Delilah. Not only do we get her name, we get this in Judges chapter 16, verse 4. After this, he, what is the word? Loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. So here he is in his 40s by this point, and we have no evidence in his biography that he ever loved anyone before he gets to this, uh, this place here, and he loved Delilah. In fact, if the word eyes is pivotal, uh, pivotal to the first story of his first marriage, the word heart is pivotal here in Judges chapter 16 regarding his relationship with Delilah. It shows up four times, the word heart shows up four times in how he relates to Delilah. So take a look at this. In Judges chapter 16, verse uh, 15, Delilah says, how can you say I love, we, love you when your heart is not with me? So circle that phrase, your heart. You see, Samson's enemies at this point had promised her a lot of money if she could find out the source of his massive strength. They recognized that there was something unearthly, something supernatural about his strength. But being pagan men, they assumed it was some amulet he was wearing or some ring he wore on his finger or some secret code that he spoke to the gods and all of a sudden he became strong and if they could find out what that was and take it away from him they would be able to overpower him and so they gave her a lot of money and said find out the source of his strength and at first he toys around with with the answer to the question about the source of his strength uh, but finally according to verse 17 he told her all his heart there's the word heart again he said, a razor has never come upon my head, for I've been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And then the word heart comes up two more times. Judges chapter 16, verse 18. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called the lords of the Philistines, saying, come up again, for he has told me all his heart. Now you circle those two times there, it shows up again, heart, four times in just a few verses. I mean, it's hard to miss that this is the main metaphor driving this story, right? The heart. And so this, this thing that the Bible says is the source of our, um, 
decision making, the source of our longing, this is the thing that Samson walked around unguarded. The eyes and the heart. The eyes were a symbol of his disordered judgment. The heart was a symbol of his disordered longings. And because these things weren't under God's control, Samson lacked self-control. You see, this isn't just some morality tale we tell each other so we can learn how to be better people. Samson lacked self-control because he was not under God's control. Self-control happens when you let God develop your judgment and when you let God develop your proper longings. You let the Word of God tell you how to be more discerning in this world and you let the Word of God tell you what you ought to long for. You're not helpless in this department. Your, your judgment, your discernment, and what you long for can be brought under the guidance and the, and the dictation of the Word of God. And when that happens, self-control happens. And when that doesn't happen, self-control does not happen. Now, if we are a city, what will happen to us if we go around with broken down walls? Now, that's the third question I want to answer today. So the first question is, how are you meant to be like a city? And we've discovered that just like a city is filled with the world's resources and energy and creativity and influence, you are to be that kind of person. But then we had to ask ourselves, where might we have broken down walls? Where might we have lack of self-control in our lives? But then the third question is, if nothing else is done about it, I mean, if you recognize that you've got broken down walls, you're not going to fix it, what's going to happen? What will happen to a city with broken down walls? Well, what happened to Samson after he revealed the source of his strength? Delilah arranged for someone to cut off his hair while he slept in, com in complete trust with his head in her lap. And when he awoke to find himself surrounded by his enemies, he said, well, I'll just get up and rout them like I did every other time. And then we get to this sad line in his story, Judges chapter 16, verse 20. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. You see, the Philistines may have assumed that there was something magical about Samson that made him powerful, but it wasn't anything magical. There wasn't anything magical about his hair. His uncut hair was a symbol of what the Old Testament called a Nazarite vow. Now, we don't know a lot about what Nazarite vows were, but those who were under the Nazarite vows refrained from doing certain things and, and they participated in other things as a symbol, as an image that they had been dedicated to God. They had been separated, set aside by God for a particular purpose. Samson had been set aside under a Nazarite vow from his birth. But the Lord left him here because Samson had repeatedly shown indifference to that. He didn't care where the source of his strength was. He just used his strength to do what he wanted to do, not what God wanted him to do with it. And because he was so careless and indifferent with the source of his strength, God left him. Samson had already left God long ago, and God finally left him. And when God left him, Samson's strength left him. And Judges chapter 16, verse 21 says, And the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and brought him down to Gaza, and bound him with bronze shackles, and he ground at the mill and the prison. The man who had been so mighty now became weak. The man who just took whatever he saw with his eyes now had no eyes to see with. And the man who menaced his enemies so terribly now ground their grain for them, walking around and around in a circle, chained to a mill wheel like a common donkey in the prison. This is the end result of somebody who lacked self-control. When you let the wall around the city of your life break down and go unguarded, devastating things can happen. It can end a marriage. It can ruin a career. It can cause a financial collapse. It can destroy a ministry. Of course, a lot of us, we live undisciplined lives and nothing this terrible has happened to us, at least not yet. Oh, we look back over our life and we realize that we could have done more with the opportunities that God gave to us, but life isn't such a wreck at this point, so maybe we made out okay. But if we, start get, if we get to thinking like that, maybe what we ought to do is think a little more about Jesus' parable of the talents. 
Jesus told a story one time and he compared himself to a rich landowner who went off on a trip. And before he went on the trip, he called three stewards to him, three servants. And he gave each of them large sums of money and said, see what you can do with this while I am away. And then after a long time, the master returns and two of the servants bring the master's original money and say, we have doubled this and we have made good on our investments with your money. And the third servant didn't do anything with his talents, with his large sums of money. He buried it in a hole in the ground and he gave it to the master upon the master's return and said, here it is, I kept it safe and sound. Now, what did the master say to this last servant? Did he say, well, at least you didn't lose it? No. He said, you wicked, lazy servant. And he cast him out of his presence. Just because our lives don't end up a wreck and a ruin like Samson's life did, or at least not yet, doesn't mean we're okay. If we are not paying attention to the resources that God has given us, the opportunities God has given us. And if we're not asking ourselves, what does God want me to do with this? We may end up like that same third servant in Jesus' parable of the talents. And we don't want to be that man. If our lack of self-discipline leads us to squander all the talent and opportunities and resources God gives us, we need to repent as Samson did. Thankfully, Samson's story isn't just about a mighty man ruined. Like every story in the Bible, it's ultimately about God. It's not ultimately about people. Right after this writer tells us about Samson's capture and how he's grinding grain for his enemies in the prison, we get this quiet little verse that shows up in Judges chapter 16, verse 22. But the hair on his head began to grow again after he'd been shaved. Now, this story isn't over after all, as a matter of fact. Now, remember what I said. There wasn't anything magical about his hair. It wasn't that he lost his strength just because they took the source of his strength, his hair. Uh, his hair was a symbol of being set apart for God. He it was under a Nazarite vow at this point. And so his hair growing back is a symbol of him waking up to his destiny. His identity is coming back. All those days walking in a circle over and over again, pushing this millstone, grinding grain like a common donkey, blinded, no longer able to see anything around him. He just mulls over and meditates over what he's done with his life, the waste of his life. Here is this man who is frail, blind, brokenhearted by the only woman he ever loved. And it starts dawning on him what he was meant to be what he was meant to do with the resources that God had given him. And that's coming back to him, just as the hair is starting to grow back on his head. And one day, 3,000 Philistines were assembled at a great feast. And they called for old, frail, blind Samson to be taken out of prison and put in front of him so he could entertain them like a circus monkey. And what does Samson do? Judges chapter 16, verse 28 says, Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me. Please strengthen me just this once, O God. And the passage says that Samson got his hands on the two middle pillars on which the whole structure rested. He put a right hand over here and a left hand over here. And asking God to give him strength, he pushed those columns down. And everything, all those great stones collapsed on top of him and collapse on top of all of Israel's enemies at the same time. It's a bittersweet ending to the story. On the one hand, for decades, he had squandered the mighty strength that God had given him. He failed to fulfill his destiny up to this point. It's only after he is reduced to this blind slave with a heart broken by the only woman he ever loved that he finally calls out to God for a chance to get things right. So there's this bitterness to the ending, but there's this sweetness too. Because God responds to him. God responds to his repentant heart. So you see, this is ultimately a story about God. It's not a story about Samson. In the period of the judges, during that time before the kings came on the scene, this was a chaotic time in Israel's history. God had to pull up from a very imperfect people, some very imperfect people, to protect Israel, preserve Israel from extermination, before things could get settled and established in the land. 
So this is one of the reasons that Samson was raised up. He was raised up to literally be a one-man army to protect Israel from extermination. And he finally accomplished that. By the time he did, he was blind, he was frail, he was brokenhearted. He had these massive stones dropping down to crush the life out of him. But in the course of it, he saved Israel from the Philistines. He saved Israel from, uh, or he saved Israel from their enemies. Don't wait so late to get things right. But get things right, no matter how late it is. That, at least on a human level, is the moral of Samson's story. Don't wait so late to get things right, but get things right no matter how late it is. You may have squandered your potential. You may have wasted your resources. You may look back over a certain measure of regret over what you've done or failed to do for God. But just like Samson at the end, at the end of your life, you too can say, Lord, give me another chance. I repent. And God will prove himself to be a gracious God. I wonder if you notice the same thing in Samson's story that I did. Very vividly, the passage says that Samson got his right hand on one column, his left hand stretched out on another column to bring the whole structure down upon him. And he died to save his people. Does that sound like somebody else you know in the Bible? The Bible tells us that when Jesus died on a cross, his right hand and left hand were stretched out and he died there to save his people. Samson then, or Jesus then, was the true and much, much, much better Samson. Jesus' birth was announced by angels, just like Samson's was. Jesus' death was to save his people, just like Samson's was. Of course, the big difference was in all those years in between, the birth and the death. While Samson lived this dissolute life, frittering away his mighty strength, letting his eyes and heart become broken down walls until his life was ruined, Jesus' life was very different. The book of Hebrews tells us, chapter 4, verse 15, Jesus has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So he resisted all the things that Samson gave him to, and more. And so when he died... It wasn't as a repentant failure like Samson. When he died, it was as a sacrificial lamb, unblemished, to take away the sin of the world. When you give yourself to him, he saves you. But when you give yourself to him, he starts molding you and shaping you. He starts shaping you into the person he wants you to be until you start looking like him. What does it mean to look like Jesus? Well, it means that you have love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. You see, the fruit of the Spirit is not just some list of moral traits you need to develop so that maybe God will finally listen to your prayers and let you into heaven. The fruit of the Spirit means the outcome of the Spirit, the end result of the Spirit, the product of the Spirit at work in your life. So it's as you receive Jesus and receive His salvation by, by grace and you let Him into your life, the end result of that will start that you'll more and more start displaying the characteristics of Jesus. Back in the early 20th century, William Temple, he was an influential church leader at that time, he once wrote, it's no good giving me a play like Hamlet or King Lear and telling me to write a play like that. Shakespeare could do it. I can't. And it is no good showing me a life like the life of Jesus and telling me to live a life like that. Jesus could do it. I can't. But if the genius of Shakespeare could somehow come and live in me, then I could write plays like his. And if the spirit of Jesus could come and live in me, then I could live a life like his. And so when you let the Spirit of Jesus come in and live in you, being your Savior and being your Lord, the end result will be fruit, the fruit of his Spirit. Let's ask him to come into us and lead and guide us. Let's pray.
Jesus, I'm grateful that the Bible stories are not just morality tales that basically just tell me, live better, do better. The Bible stories are ultimately about you, Jesus, not me. Samson's story is about you, Jesus, not Samson. His story is about a God who calls and a God who resources us to fulfill the call. And his story is about a God who gives us chance after chance to come back after we've failed. Jesus, you are the true and much, much better Samson who died to save your people, who died to save me. Save me. And each day, every day, I give you control so that I might have self-control. I want my longings and my judgments to be brought into alignment with you, with your word. And so I ask you to help me in this department. I ask you to help the people to my right and to my left, people in front of me, behind me, people I may not even know by name. But I ask that you will do the same for them that I'm asking you to do for me. And I pray this all would be done in accordance with your name, Jesus. Amen. There's a connection card inside your bulletin, or if you're watching online, you can uh, uh, point your phone at the QR code and get that connection card. We would love for you to fill that out. At least put your name down. And uh, if you come with, uh, to our place every week, uh, we ask you to do this every week. So just put your name down and then offer your pen or pencil to somebody around you so that they can have something to write with and put their name down too, maybe an email address. If you are a guest of ours, we're glad to have you here. And we'd love a little more information on that card from you. If you would maybe give us an email address or a physical address so we can know how to email you or mail you some more information about our church. After the service is up, we've got a coffee fellowship and I'll be there in the, in the gymnasium, the multi-purpose center. And so make your way there, won't you? We're still under construction over here, so this hallway's closed, but just follow the crowd out this hallway. Follow the signs into our gym. There's fresh ground coffee and tea and snacks waiting for you. And, and then I'd love to be introduced to you as well and know uh, what your impressions were about this hour with our church. After that, we have uh, a life group hour. And so at our church, we have this big assembly here, and then we break into smaller groups where people can kind of go deeper into their relationships with each other and learn a bit more about the Word of God. And so I hope you'll stay and be a part of that as well. Let's have our ushers and musicians come up to lead us in this offertory prayer. And uh, we've got Steve Ladd as our deacon of the week, and he'll uh, lead us in this offertory prayer. So glad to have you gathered with us today. And I hope this school year is starting out great for all of you. All right, Steve, let's pray. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, study that Pastor Tom has led us through this morning and this summer to better recognize the fruit that result from having your spirit active in our hearts. Guide us to walk in your ways, Lord, and to better embody the fruit of the spirit in our daily lives. As we prepare our offerings this morning, uh, we recognize and thank you for the abundance of blessings in our lives. We recognize that everything that we have comes from your generosity. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Of loss and loneliness, 
open up my eyes so I may see that you, my God, will walk with me. Have a great day. Bye now.